You're listening to Patch Bay on TYM KRS. Welcome to Patch Bay, a show where we talk about audio stuff, engineering, music, instruments, stuff like that, amplifiers. Hey, Shane. Hey, how's it going? Oh, just fine. I'd, yeah. uh, we've been doing a little bit of our own audio engineering before the show today, and we completely failed, so... Yeah. Well, we didn't fail. It did work. It just didn't work well. <laughs> yeah. Shane's trying to find a better mic solution so you guys don't have to listen to his crappy headset. Um, yeah. But uh, we tried a lav today, and it's like a lav from like 1962 or something, right? Uh, give or take. Yeah, it's from Radio Shack, and they don't call it Radio Shack anymore. They call it The Source. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's definitely a few years old. I'm actually looking at the box right now to see if there's any kind of... Uh, a date on it. It's probably like 1988 or something. Interesting. It was made in China, distributed in Canada, and the trademark is for Tandy Corporation. So. Ooh, yeah, so definitely <laughs> in the 80s when Radio Shack and Tandy were partnered up. <laughs> it might actually be worth some money. I was going to take it apart and steal capacitors and crap out of it. I'm amazed it works. But... Uh, I was mentioning that uh, they've changed the frequencies on those um, since. And you're no longer, at least not here in the U.S., allowed to use the packs from back then because that frequency spectrum has been reallocated to other purposes. So it's mm. technically illegal here to run transmitters on those frequencies. Oh, I'm sure it's illegal here, too. And I'm sure my neighbor is probably phoning somebody complaining about something that's not working. But, hey... Whatever. It was, I got it in a box of audio goodies, so I figured I would give it a go. It does actually work as a preamp as well, and I was amazed at the fact that it worked as a preamp, although the audio wasn't as good as we had a, a little high-end loss sort of thing. And, and was there a plosive issue? Probably. I mean, it's yeah. it's a lav, but you know, you're not usually sticking it right in your face hole, so probably sure. no plosives. But I could definitely hear your sweater. It sounded lovely. Yes. I know. It's a very nice sweater, Shane. I tend to tune my sweaters all to the key of D. Uh-huh, yeah, well. Yeah, that way that, you know, if I diff wear a different sweater on a different day, we're still in the same key. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> so what do you want to talk about tonight? Well, I was thinking about uh, metering, actually. Um, so here in my little studio, I've got some analog meters and some um, digital meters running in the DAW and stuff like that. But I was really curious as to um, what kind of metering do you rely on every day in the studio? Um, I usually uh, in the I have like there's there's a, a metering on the O1B and I also... Okay, for those so, who don't know, what's that? Yeah. My Yamaha O&V console, it's a 16-channel, 8-in, uh, 8-out uh, digital console, which is kind of cute because it's got plugins and uh, EQs and compressors on every channel if you need them. Um, so it goes optical. But um, So there's meters on that, which I don't really keep an eye on too much because I know if I'm burning the mic pre, I'm going to, because it's a digital link. You're going to hear it. Here, I'm going to hear it. So if I burn the mic pre, I'm going to hear it in Pro Tools, and I'm going to hear it. I'm going to hear it when it hits the board. Um, but normally, I'm monitoring uh, pre-fader in Pro Tools. So, um, and that's usually how I do it. I'm just thinking, why do I do pre-fader? Uh, right. The reason I do it pre-fader is that <clears throat> then I'm getting the actual input signal rather than the input signal in relation to where the fader is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's normally what I use. I do have a little uh, VU box that is RCA in, and so I have a, a, a stereo signal that comes out of Pro Tools that goes to the, the VU, just mostly just to light up and go back and forth, although I do keep an eye on it. Uh, for when I'm mastering, stuff like that. But yeah, normally everything is done just in Pro Tools. That's usually how I keep an eye on things. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, some of the guys here at the Hackerspace, um, our local thing, have been talking about building a, uh, um, a v basically a, a big color VU meter uh, built with color LEDs and stuff like that. And Ooh. it's always interesting to see how 
non-engineering people approach the idea of seeing levels and seeing frequency, uh, spectrum information, and all that sort of thing. Um, I think it'd be really cool to have a uh, an oscilloscope and a spectrum analyzer attached to the uh, mixing console. I think that would be great. But of course, I'm coming at things from a very technical standpoint too. I know I can, I can totally see the use for having them. Uh, regardless, even in the studio, it's nice. I, you have to watch with spectrum analyzers if you just keep an eye on those only. I I I had a a little issue a little while ago about that. And I could tell that the guy who didn't like my mix was just looking at the spectrum analyzer and he wasn't actually listening <laughs> to the mix. Like he was seeing it rather than hearing it. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I could totally see having those in line, especially if you've got an older console with auxiliaries, you know, like a ton of auxiliaries that you're not even using for anything. Um, I remember a guy was telling me he had a, a 24 channel Mackie, uh, not the SR series, but the, like the recording console series. I don't know what they're called, but he used to always have an auxiliary open on every channel and it was pointed at, or it, the output of the auxiliary went to a uh, rack mount tuner. So no matter what you were plugged into, you could always check the tuning, which was kind of handy. Yeah, a bit overkill though. Bit of overkill, yeah. I mean, you could just plug into it, but I, I thought it was a smart idea to use if you've got, you know, six auxiliaries and you're not using them for anything. <clears throat> I've got a yeah. uh, uh, cool little project I did a while back that I call the uh, the Proto Synth. It's uh, a synthesizer I built myself, and cool. uh, it's got a bunch of uh, solderless breadboards built up where the knobs would normally be, so you can uh, basically change the circuit. Uh, however you feel like that in that minute. Cool. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty interesting project, but one of the things I picked up uh, as being very useful when working with it is that I just take an old 1970s uh, analog oscilloscope and uh, plug it into the output um, of that thing so that I can monitor what the waveforms are doing in real time on the scope. And I think that sort of equipment should be more standard in recording studios and uh, audio in general. Uh, being able to see the waveforms is really helpful as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I, that actually brings up, a, it brings up a good point. I mean, it's amazing that you never see them. As far as I've ever, I've never seen an oscilloscope. Like uh, the one you're talking about for doing electronics. Um, in a studio ever, <laughs> as far as I know. And um, it, to me, I, that doesn't make sense, because if you really want to know what's going on with a signal, mm -hmm. there's very few better ways to just get right down to the root of the problem than just looking at it on an oscilloscope or a spectrum analyzer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not talking about the cheesy spectrum analyzer that you get in Winamp. <laughs> I'm talking about Although, like a like a you know ten thousand dollar hardware unit. You know it 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 shows all of the frequency bands up through mm -hmm. you know the the gigahertz range, and you can see every harmonic that's getting in the signal. I mean, if you've got a problem with any sort of noise coming out of your system, you'll see a spike on the spectrum analyzer, mm -hmm. and you can get right to you know solving it. I think they would but, be great yeah. for recording studios, and the budget is high enough at a recording studio where they could justify it. I can see them definitely having them in mastering studios. I mean, they got fifteen thousand dollars stereo EQs in some mastering studios that I've uh, read about. So uh, the big difference between regular engineering and mastering studio gear is the concentric knob. Mm. So you can click in exactly where you were, not about where you were. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you have to recall. But yeah, I mean. I was going to say, as far as Spectrum Analyzer is concerned, I mean, as you know, there's lots of plug-in versions of them, but they don't even go as high as gigahertz. I don't think they'll. Oh no, they, no, no, no! They top out at at 48 or whatever. Yeah, kilohertz and, is where they would stop. Yeah, uh, that is an interesting point, though. That would be it. Would be curious to even even for the sake of say recording in a room and somebody's got a cell phone in there, is that even you know? <laughs> Is yeah, it, I wouldn't. Emanating stuff. I'm just. It is. Curiosity. It is. Yeah, 
sure it is. It's a radio but, transmitter, so it is, and it yeah. can be picked up by your, your mixing console and all your preamps. But a lot of those things are really well shielded. I mean, that's why you're paying out the ear for them, right? Yeah, my, um, I've always, always, always had a problem with the AKG C12 that I have at work and cell phones. It does not play nice, as like it does not play nice at all. Um, basically, if I'm using that mic, there's no cell phones on the room. <laughs> Uh, because I mean, the mic was made, you know, in 1985 or whatever it was. So this is pre cell phone usage yeah. and tube equipment too. So it just acts as an antenna. Uh, I get some very weirdo sounds coming from the mic. If you're talking, what tends to happen, which drives me up the wall is somebody will answer the phone while recording vocals or after or between takes or something. And they'll be They'll have headphones on standing in front of the microphone and they'll be talking on the phone and all of a sudden they'll be making, not squeals, but just very weird O sounds. <laughs> Something that almost like on a stylescope, not on a stylescope, but like on, a, on a, like a potentiometer or something where you would be like squelching kind of going, like oh, like a wah-wah kind of a thing. Like yeah, low. yeah, I, I bet that's, you know, some sort of, you know, either the digital signal uh, that's being you know, shot across the the airwaves by that cell phone is just getting yeah. picked up, and yeah, it's uh, not surprising. It, it, it's RF, and you don't want RF in around mics that aren't shielded properly. So no, yeah. exactly. And I mean, well, not even so much not shielded properly as just like super old. Uh, but that mic in particular is was ungrounded on purpose. Um, just the the out. Because there was a weirdo um, ground hum thing that was happening on it, but it has since been cleared up. Not, pardon me, not on the XLR pin. On the, it's not a three prong plug. It's only a two prong one at this point, I believe. But it solved the hum situation back in the day. So. Yeah, ground loops can be really annoying. Oh yeah. Well, we used to. We did when we were using an analog console. And the analog console I used to have was RCA, which was a giant pain in the ass because it was 32 channel RCA ins and outs, XLR and quarter inch insert points. But um, the actual tape ins and outs were RCA. Uh, so that, like 32 channels, you know, you could get into some serious weirdo ground stuff. Now, since switching over to a digital console, have you found that a lot of the analog problems like 60 cycle hum and ground loops and all that sort of thing just kind of go away um as far as recording them i don't get any low-end weirdness anymore um i used to when we had the analog console i used to have a 60 hertz hum um continuously on on the task cam. however uh, when I switched to the Soundcraft 2400, um, which wasn't wired to the ground, I didn't have any hum. And in the Pro Tools uh, digital sort of setup, I don't have any weirdness. But if you pin the uh, console, there is some top end noise. But we're talking at like what would be stadium volume if I was playing back music in the room yeah you know. um the have you ever grounded this a studio like do you know sort of the process for that um i i know a bit about a, a thing or two um so uh, in the studio there have uh you guys installed sort of a earth ground system we wired to the panel we wired a ground to the panel okay so uh, what ended up happening because the panel is grounded like the, the, there's a there's a separate panel for the studio for the um, the whatever the electrical panel mm -hmm. um, so what we did because there was holes through the floor where we ran the snakes um, we ran ran a grounding cable from the back of the console to the actual uh, electrical panel and that did clear up most of the grounding issues we were having as far as low end hum, not, excuse me, not electrocuting anybody, but yeah, uh, we never electrocuted anybody. Just, yeah. But it was a lot worse 
with the Tascam, obviously because of the fact that it, I, you know, just 32 channels of RCA ins and outs, 64, 64 RCA cables. Patch Bay was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. eighth of an inch. Yeah. Sure. So, um, uh, I, I, if I were going to build a recording studio like in its own building, I think I would probably just put a Faraday cage in the walls. A what cage? A uh, Faraday cage is basically um, any metal container uh, usually made out of some sort of wire mesh. Uh, and then you connect the entire cage to an earth ground. So basically any RF that comes in contact with it automatically gets shunted directly to ground and it never gets inside the cage. Right, 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 right. That makes sense, actually. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, uh, this is, you know, I think that it would be good to bring a little bit more engineering back into this sort of thing because electrical engineers know some tricks that are really useful to helping everyday problems um, that yeah. audio engineers have to deal with. And, you know, if you don't have that background in electronics, you kind of have to just sort of guess at what's going on sometimes. Um, back in the day, like in the, the old school 50s buzz cut dude era, they had electrical engineers working in all the studios taking care of these problems. And I think it would be kind of cool to see that kind of thinking come back into things more. It's kind of difficult, though, with everything being done in the box now. Uh, we we're getting farther and farther away from that sort of mentality. I agree. I agree. Um, it scares me, actually, matter of fact. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, professional type guys love the in the box stuff for the, you know, not every one of us do, but we do like the idea of it for certain things. But it's also opened that whole door to um, everybody doing it, which, you know, is, is fine, but it, it tends to also take away from what was originally sort of voodoo <laughs> well, you know you can sort of look at it as like damn kids get off my lawn yeah it's, or you it's, can it's, look it's, at it as more like okay you got all these kids with no budgets trying to record s music in their bedrooms and garages or whatever and it's an opportunity to introduce them to a whole realm of learning that they would never be exposed to if they hadn't been into music so maybe it's a good thing yeah, I I, th I think it is. I, I think it's a. I'm curious to know what the future holds. Um, I think recording studios as they are nowadays, as as it stands already, they're becoming um, not extinct but dinosaurs. But you know, it sooner rather than later, there's going to be a lot less, you know, big studios out there, which is you know is, is fine. Um, it is good for the, you know, for, like you say, they're, they're, the, the cool thing about it is there people are still making music. It's not that there's any lack of, actually, I think there's more music, interest in music nowadays than there ever was. Yeah, because people have access to being able to make their own again, uh, which is a really good thing. I mean, for a long time, the recording studios and more accurately, the record labels sort of controlled the whole thing. And um, that's no longer the case, and I think that's really good. Um, I, I know it's not necessarily good for professional um, recording engineers like yourself, but no. um, for everyone else, it's really good. Yeah, no, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around what um, what the next step is, actually, technically, but that's, uh, that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> for the time being, I'll continue to keep doing what it is that I do. But, uh, yeah, no, it is good. I The only thing I think about the whole new, new technology thing is that it's great that there's more interest in music, but as a just a music listener, you have to sort of sort through quite a lot more stuff until you get to the stuff that you quite like or that is really good. Do you yeah. find that? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I don't spend as much time... Uh, listening to other people's music as I should probably. Um, and when I do find things I like, it tends to be more on the raw uh, side of things. So to find it, you kind of have to go to those uh, backwaters of the internet uh, where some random person is posting a random video of themselves playing somewhat okay, but uh, singing amazingly. 
because mm. they have not been discovered and that, that's the best time to to get in um, there's definitely a, a difference in is sometimes the polish ruins the original thought yeah that can definitely be the case uh there's so many artists that i found on youtube and i've started watching their sort of videos um of them doing their original work and it seems like the ones who are good always end up following the same path they they get better and better at making their sound more polished and eventually they start doing more and more covers and they get you know some sort of uh deal going uh be it their own small label or working with someone else and that's about the time where I just unfollow them because they cease to be interesting. Mm-hmm. No, I, I agree with you. Uh, the one specifically that pops to my brain is the that Maria Aragorn. Did you ever hear any of her stuff? No, not that one. No, she's from Winnipeg, and uh, she did a. You'll have to check it out. She did a cover of a. Uh, she's a great piano player, great singer. She's like 13 years old. She did a cover of a Lady Gaga song. Uh, she ended up on Ellen. She ended up on stage with Lady Gaga. Like, it was a crazy, crazy story. And I haven't heard anything from her since, which is kind of, I guess, maybe the opposite of sort of what you were talking about. But, yeah, just a YouTube sensation. Kind mm-hmm. of a neat neat story. Um, I was going to say, we were talking about RF. Have you ever had the old AM radio coming through the amp thing happen? Oh, yeah, sure. That's... uh. That's a pretty common one, especially if you're in an area where the transmitters are really beefy. Yeah, it's not yeah. hard because amplitude modulation, it, it physically, you know, in, in the physics sense, works in a way where it's very, very simple to demodulate it down to a audible uh, audio frequency sort of range. All it, like uh, uh, my partner in crime over here, Addie, uh, she's actually built a AM demodulator, you know, essentially an AM radio okay. out of a uh, razor blade and a pencil. Um, really? Yeah, if you heat the razor blade up, you can get uh, an oxidized layer on it, uh, like blue razors. You you may be old enough to remember those, Shane. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that oxidized yeah. layer acts as sort of a uh, semiconductor. Uh, electricity only goes through it in one direction. When you touch it up against carbon, which is, of course, what pencils are made out of. So you squeeze those two things together into a junction, and it acts as a very, very simple diode. And the amplitude goes back and forth, back and forth through that diode, and it sort of demodulates it, and you can hear the audio coming out the other side. And that same effect can happen in any number of different ways in your audio equipment, uh, in various oscillators and diodes, any of them can act as these demodulators, and then you start picking up your local baseball game or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's that's awesome. I was gonna say that that was almost worth an f bomb at that point, uh, just for the the sake of having building built that and make and having it work. <laughs> uh, that's cool. That the 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 science and and technology behind it is amazing. I mean, it's stuff that people have been doing for a long time but to be able to build it at home and have it work is crazy um yeah neat totally neat i was gonna say i've the only time that has ever happened to me is either with a really old tube amp or marshall's and i think it's just mostly because of the immense amount of gain yeah and and single coils yeah it's usually it's you know the single coil on the our dan electro u1 will do it the uh, tube preamps will do it occasionally, especially if you have a long wire going between your mic and uh, the preamp. Uh, the shorter the wire, the better. Basically, yeah. any metal uh, in front of the first gain stage is acting as an antenna. So, you know, you want to make sure you keep that as short as possible. Totally. Uh, when you're doing that, are you using XLR and still having trouble? Yeah, you can eliminate a lot of it by using balanced XLR. Uh, but around here, we do experimental things a lot. So the reason why you'll get it more on, a, say, a guitar is because it's not a balanced signal. It's an unbalanced uh, instrument cable. Right. And that doesn't have the, I don't know, I don't want to get into explaining the electrical properties of unbalanced versus balanced today because that's like a whole show unto itself. But 
the short version is that with a balanced cable, any interference that comes in is basically stomped out just by the way that balanced cables work. Yeah, I believe it's a phase thing, but yeah, no, yeah, you're right. It, it is it, a phase uh, thing. You've got it, your phase and you've got your inverted phase and they get summed together on the other side. Zeroes um, it out. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, yeah. Well, it's exactly the same premise as how humbuckers work. Yep. It's exactly the same. And, and if you're a guitar player, like, oh, it yeah, makes sense now, I get it. But, uh, yeah, no, that, that is, that's definitely a show, a whole show unto itself. Completely. So, I don't know. Um, yeah, we've, we've dealt with some AM problems here and there. But, uh, yeah, they're, it's pretty easy to fix that kind of thing. Basically, if you have AM problems, you need to adjust things. Uh, more of the interference issues that we have is because we have so many computers and monitors and all that running up here in the studio. We'll pick up um, high-frequency lines from CFLs and um, the yeah the LCD monitors in uh, the single-coil pickup really bad. I can't even use yeah. it to record up here. No, yeah. Uh, anytime I ever do any recording um, at work, in front of the computer, I usually nine times out of ten, I'm just turning the monitor off um, or having the guitar. It, it's funny with single coils because you can it. Well, it's hard when you're engineering and playing and doing everything at the same time. But uh, you know, you just move that like half an inch one way, and it's like, oh, there goes the noise. It's gone now. You know, have you have you done that before? Yeah, the sort of yeah. weird walk. <laughs> oh, it's good if I turn my back to you and have yeah, a nice yeah. three angle. Done it a hundred times, yeah. It's uh, yeah, <laughs> and basically that's because a single coil is it's basically a magnet with a coil wrapped around it, and if you turn that, uh, in within the electromagnetic field, right? If you turn that coil so that it's in between the bands, the bands are just gonna whoosh right past it, and it's not gonna act as a uh, an antenna. And uh, yeah, be yeah, fun. but if you turn it so that it's pointing the correct direction to pick up that wave, then you're going to hear it. You're going to hear 60 cycle hum like crazy. I wonder, um, this is completely probably boneheaded, but if you were playing a single coil guitar, and is there anything you could do to hum buckets, having a magnet on you, maybe? Probably well, not, eh? No, because you need the signals to be uh, with a humbucking, oh. you know, phase reversal and then, you know, resumming. They need yeah. to be, the, the signal part needs to be absolutely identical, right? Right, yeah. So no, the that's... closer it is to identical, the cleaner it's going to be on the other side. And that's why humbucker pickups sound muddy compared to single coil pickups. Because a humbucker has two pickups, they're not exactly the same. And the slight differences get canceled out by the balanced nature of the recombination. And that's why you lose some high end on a humbucker. I have, uh, I actually have uh, hot rails in my guitar, um, which I don't know if is technically a humbucker. Uh, technically, I think it is as far as the pole pieces are concerned. But um, it, it, it sounds quite a lot more like a the old single coils that were in there sand the hum. Yeah. There is still a little bit, but it's not like it was with, with single coils. Um, I don't know. I, I, I quite like it as an alternative at this point. I'm considering doing it to the other guitar. <laughs> yeah. How are we doing for time? Uh, we just got a minute here left. Um, uh, single coils are, they sound amazing. Um, I know almost everyone uses the, the humbuckers because you just kind of have to, but if you had a nice guitar room with a Faraday cage in the wall, you could use single coils all day long and get that crisp, clean, high end that uh, we're all missing out on. I agree. Uh, I, I almost didn't want to do it to the Strat, and I still have the pickups, but uh, the Strat that I had, but... He was getting to the point playing live that I needed a reliable, comfortable guitar that wasn't friggin' noisy. So I had to sacrifice single coil, you know, yumminess for the noise was driving me bonkers. <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to play a Les Paul, so um, that's what I... But yeah, I mean, if, if 
every single recording that I've ever done, uh, more often than not, it's the single coil guitars that I'm quite a lot more happy with in the studio. Uh, even my Telecaster, which is actually not even grounded properly um, in the studio, sounds great, is pretty well clean. Uh, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's the, you're right, you have the guitar room and it makes a huge hell of Huge difference, especially on a recording, you know. Yeah. So I guess today's episode was all about how sometimes the analog mojo of the world can, you know, interfere with uh, what we're trying to do. But if you understand (laughs) it, you can use that same power to um, get the things you want to happen much more easily. So, you know, if, if you're into this kind of thing, take the time, learn about uh, how uh, electronics work if you want to. If you don't, just do it in the box. That's fine, too. As long as you're making music, I don't care. Exactly, exactly. I was going to say, it's analog, uh, wanted analog mojo versus unwanted analog mojo. <laughs> it's basically what it is. Because somebody else is happy with their AM signal. It's just, you know, screwing with my guitar amp sound. Yeah, the, the dude listening to the baseball game is very appreciative of that electromagnetic interference. Okay, Shane, that's all, right, all the time we have for today. You guys can find this show every Friday usually in the evenings at patchbay.tv. There's an RSS feed there on the page if you want to automatically have it downloaded by your cell phone, your uh, iTunes, anything like that. It'll work. Um, Yeah, or you can just push play on the page. It's really easy. That's it for us for this week. We'll see you guys next week. Good night.